IBM OS 2. IBM OS 2 was originally built as a joint project between IBM and Microsoft, intended to replace the limitations of the early Windows line with a more stable, more modern, and more professional-grade operating system. The partnership fell apart quickly, but not before IBM OS 2 inherited the worst possible combination, the complexity of a corporate engineering project and the marketing clarity of a committee meeting. IBM OS 2 introduced several features that were far ahead of early Windows. It supported true preemptive multitasking, which means the system could decide when a program had used enough CPU time, instead of politely waiting for the program to give control back. It also supported protected memory, preventing applications from corrupting each other. In the 1980s, that was practically sorcery, especially compared to Windows 3.0, where one misbehaving app could take the whole machine down with the enthusiasm of a collapsing Jenga tower. It also shipped with the Workplace Shell, a graphical interface built around object-oriented concepts. You could treat folders and system components as actual manipulable objects. Even today, parts of its design still look surprisingly modern. Unfortunately, looking modern and becoming mainstream are two very different skills, and IBM OS 2 excelled at the wrong one. The biggest problem was compatibility. Microsoft quickly shifted its focus toward Windows, giving IBM OS 2 the same level of attention you give a houseplant you regret buying. Most developers followed Microsoft's lead, writing their software exclusively for Windows instead of maintaining two separate code bases. IBM tried to fix this with a subsystem that let OS 2 run Windows applications, but the performance and compatibility were inconsistent. If an app launched correctly, it often behaved like it was being held together with glue and optimism. IBM also made strategic mistakes in marketing. The system was pushed as a corporate solution, but enterprises were already standardizing on Windows. Personal users barely knew it existed, and the ones who did were often confused about whether it was the future of Windows or the thing that definitely is not the future of Windows. By the late 1990s, Windows 95 and Windows 98 had completely overtaken the market. IBM OS 2 slowly faded into niche banking systems and ATMs, kept alive mostly because institutions preferred running ancient software over rewriting everything from scratch. Maintenance officially ended in 2006, by which time the only remaining users were companies who also still trusted fax machines as mission-critical technology. BOS BOS was created by B Incorporated as a clean, modern operating system designed specifically for multimedia. Long before multimedia meant streaming five different videos while your browser eats three gigabytes of RAM, the system focused on high responsiveness, low latency, and efficient multithreading, meaning it could split tasks into many parallel threads and keep everything smooth even under heavy workloads. BOS achieved this by being built from scratch instead of inheriting decades of legacy code. Its file system, called B File System, supported extended attributes, allowing files to behave more like tiny databases instead of simple blobs of data. Its kernel was optimized to take advantage of symmetric multiprocessing, allowing it to scale extremely well with multiple CPUs at a time when most consumer systems were still single core. The user interface was simple, clean, and fast, built around instantly launching applications and responsive windows. On paper, BOS looked like the ideal operating system for the coming age of digital audio, video editing, and creative production. In practice, it it had the same problem many promising operating systems face. Almost nobody shipped hardware for it, and almost nobody wrote software for it. B Incorporated tried partnering with Apple in the mid-1990s, hoping BOS would become the future Mac operating system. Apple decided to buy Next instead, and BOS was left without a major hardware partner. They then tried targeting the consumer PC market, but that was already locked down by Windows 95 and Windows 98. BOS could boot extremely fast, sometimes in 10 seconds on the hardware of the time, but users pick the platform that actually runs their applications, not the one that starts quickly and then has nothing to open. Even worse, Microsoft's licensing agreements with PC manufacturers strongly discouraged them from shipping multiple operating systems. A system could technically support BIOS, but you often had to install it yourself, which eliminated the mainstream audience entirely. The result was a small but passionate user base, excellent engineering, and almost no real market penetration. By 2001, B Incorporated was out of money and out of options. The technology was sold to Palm, the original company dissolved, and BOS quietly joined the long list of brilliant operating systems that were simply born in the wrong decade. Apple Copland Apple Copland was Apple's ambitious attempt to modernize the classic Mac operating system without replacing it entirely. The plan was simple, rebuild the system from the inside out while keeping full compatibility with everything that came before it. The result was not simple. In fact, Copland became the perfect example of what happens when a company tries to renovate a house, while people are still living 
living in it, using tools it has not finished designing. The goal of Copland was to introduce true multitasking, protected memory, and a modular architecture. Classic macOS lacked all three. One crashing application could freeze the entire machine, and the system relied heavily on cooperative multitasking, which meant every program had to politely yield control. If an application refused to cooperate, the whole system patiently followed it off a cliff. Copland was intended to fix this by moving to a microkernel design. The kernel would handle memory protection, preemptive multitasking, and device management. Everything else would be loaded as modular components. Apple also planned to introduce an updated user interface with modernized menus, visuals, and window management. Unfortunately, the project quickly collapsed under its own weight. Apple attempted to ship Copland incrementally, but every feature depended on several other features that were also unfinished. The engineering teams worked in parallel without coordinated integration, creating a situation where the operating system existed primarily as a collection of promising prototypes that could not be combined into a functioning whole. Internal reports later described Copland as unrealizable, meaning that finishing it would require rewinding time and redesigning the Macintosh architecture from scratch. Even worse, Microsoft Windows 95 launched during this period with advanced graphics and a robust application ecosystem, instantly making Apple's aging system look obsolete. Apple spent millions on Copland, missed every release target, and watched the project turn from a modernization effort into a brand-defining crisis. In 1996, Apple officially canceled Copland. Later that year, the company purchased Next, replacing the Copland dream with the Next Step reality that eventually became Mac OS. In short, Apple Copland failed not because the ideas were bad, but because the company attempted a total reinvention while simultaneously trying not to break anything. The result was that nothing worked, and everything broke anyway. Solaris. Solaris, originally developed by Sun Microsystems, was one of the most respected Unix operating systems in the enterprise world. It powered data centers, universities, financial institutions, and high-end servers throughout the 1990s and early 2000s. Unlike most systems on this list, Solaris did not fail because of technical shortcomings. It failed because of what often kills good technology, corporate acquisition, shifting priorities, and a gradual decline in relevance as the world standardizes around cheaper, simpler platforms. Solaris introduced several advanced technologies long before they became industry standards. Its Z file system provided snapshots, data integrity checks, and storage pooling at a time when similar features required expensive third-party hardware. Its container system allowed isolated environments long before containerization became mainstream. Its symmetric multiprocessing support made Solaris ideal for large multi-CPU servers. The operating system ran primarily on SPARC hardware, a processor architecture designed by Sun. This tight integration produced stable and highly optimized systems, but it also made the platform increasingly neat. As the industry moved toward commodity x86 servers running Linux, Solaris began to look like an elegant but expensive solution to problems cheaper machines could also solve. The pivotal moment came in 2010 when Oracle acquired Sun Microsystems. Under Sun, Solaris had an open development model with community participation. Oracle ended that by closing the source code, halting public builds, and shifting Solaris into a slow, proprietary release cycle. Features that were once cutting edge stopped evolving quickly and developers who previously contributed patches and tools simply migrated to Linux, where development remained open and agile. Oracle's focus shifted to enterprise contracts and long-term support agreements, not general adoption. As a result, Solaris lost its momentum. Organizations began migrating away from SPARC systems due to cost, and x86 Solaris could not compete with rapidly advancing Linux distributions that updated multiple times per year. By 2019, Oracle effectively ended active Solaris development. The system was placed into sustaining support, which is corporate language for we will answer your emails, but do not expect anything new. Solaris didn't collapse suddenly. It quietly aged out of the mainstream while faster and cheaper Unix-like platforms took over. Windows Mobile Windows Mobile was Microsoft's early attempt to bring its desktop ecosystem into the mobile world. It was built on Windows CE, a compact kernel designed for handheld devices, and its entire interface mimicked the desktop environment. Start menu, taskbar, drop-down windows, and menus sized for a mouse instead of a human thumb. Using it on a touchscreen felt like performing surgery with oven mitts. The system supported multitasking, stylus input, and a surprisingly deep application framework. It worked well for business tasks, email, calendars, document editing, and corporate synchronization through Microsoft Exchange. For years, this made it the default choice for enterprises deploying handheld devices to employees. Smartphones in that era were not consumer entertainment devices. They were pocket-sized office tools that made push email feel like a luxury. Windows Mobile's downfall 
Wall began when smartphones shifted from stylus-driven navigation to capacitive touchscreens. The iPhone established a new standard with finger-friendly interactions, smooth animations, and applications designed around gestures instead of menus. Windows Mobile, designed around tiny drop-down lists and pixel-precise taps, simply could not adapt fast enough. Applications were another major problem. The Windows Mobile app ecosystem was fragmented, difficult to develop for, and heavily biased toward enterprise tools rather than consumer experiences. Developers moved to iOS and Android because the platforms were simpler to build for and offered access to rapidly growing user bases willing to buy apps. Microsoft attempted to update the system with Windows Mobile 6.5, which added finger-friendly icons and UI tweaks, but the underlying architecture still belonged to the stylus era. The company ultimately scrapped the platform and replaced it with the entirely new Windows Phone operating system. Unfortunately, that transition erased backward compatibility, meaning every Windows Mobile app instantly became obsolete. In 2010, Microsoft officially ended its strategy around Windows Mobile. The operating system that once dominated business handhelds lost its market overnight when mobile computing shifted from office in your pocket to entertainment, communication, and software ecosystem in your pocket. It was a failure not of engineering, but of timing, and of assuming the future of smartphones would look like the past. Windows RT Windows RT was Microsoft's attempt to bring Windows to battery-efficient ARM processors, the same type of chips used in smartphones and tablets. On paper, the idea was logical. Offer a Windows-like experience on lightweight, long-lasting devices. In practice, Windows RT delivered a version of Windows that looked familiar, acted familiar, and then politely informed you that it could not actually run any of the software you expected Windows to run. The system launched alongside the first Surface tablet. The hardware was solid, the battery life was good, and the design was competitive for its time. The problem was the software model. Windows RT could only run applications compiled specifically for ARM architecture and distributed through the Windows Store. Traditional desktop software, everything from Chrome to Photoshop to simple utility programs, was incompatible. Even worse, Windows RT allowed a desktop mode but restricted it almost entirely to Microsoft's own apps. Users felt like they were being allowed to sit in the driver's seat of a car without permission to touch the steering wheel. The Windows Store itself did not help. It lacked essential applications, had inconsistent quality, and grew too slowly to support an entire ecosystem. Developers ignored Windows RT because its user base was small, and the user base stayed small because developers ignored it. It was a perfect feedback loop of failure. Performance issues also emerged. The ARM hardware struggled with desktop-style multitasking, especially when running multiple modern UI apps at the same time. The result was an experience that felt like Windows, looked like Windows, and ran like a budget tablet trying its best to imitate Windows. Microsoft attempted to push updates, reduce restrictions, and improve the store, but the fundamental limitations never changed. By 2015, Windows RT was discontinued, replaced by Windows on ARM, an operating system that eventually supported full x86 emulation, something Windows RT desperately needed but never received. In the end, Windows RT failed because it promised Windows without actually being Windows. Users did not want almost Windows, sort of Windows, or Windows with a strict diet. They wanted the real thing, and Windows RT was not equipped to deliver it. BlackBerry OS BlackBerry OS began as the gold standard for mobile communication. Its push email system, physical keyboard design, and strong security features made it the default choice for governments, corporations, and anyone who wanted to look extremely busy while typing rapidly with their thumbs. The operating system excelled at messaging efficiency, low data usage, and network reliability. For years, it defined what a smartphone was supposed to be. The architecture of BlackBerry OS was optimized for narrowband mobile networks. Applications were lightweight, tightly controlled, and often relied on BlackBerry's own back-end infrastructure. This created reliable performance, excellent battery life, and end-to-end -end encryption that appealed to high-security industries. It also created a dependency. The system's intelligence lived partly on the device and partly on BlackBerry servers, which limited how freely developers could build complex standalone applications. The smartphone landscape changed dramatically after 2007. The iPhone shifted consumer expectations from portable communication device to full computing platform. Touchscreens, rich applications, gesture-based navigation, and advanced web integration became standard. BlackBerry OS was not built for this world. Its interface remained oriented around keyboards, scroll wheels, and menu-driven navigation. Making it touchscreen capable required workarounds that felt bolted onto a system designed for a completely different era. Developers were another turning point. The BlackBerry App World Store launched late, lacked key applications, and was difficult to develop for compared to iOS and Android. Building apps required navigating the limits of Java ME, dealing with inconsistent hardware, and working around system
system restrictions. Developers quickly moved to platforms with larger, more profitable audiences. BlackBerry attempted multiple responses. They added touch screens, improved the browser, and created transitional models that supported both touch and physical keyboards. But these devices relied on the aging BlackBerry OS architecture, which was never designed for high-performance graphics, modern app frameworks, or fluid touch interaction. The company ultimately replaced BlackBerry OS with BlackBerry 10, a new system built on the QNX microkernel. By the time it launched, the market had already consolidated around iOS and Android. In 2013, BlackBerry OS received its final update. The operating system that once dominated enterprise mobility became another example of what happens when a platform excels at yesterday's problems while ignoring tomorrow's requirements. Symbian OS Symbian OS began as a joint industry effort to build a powerful, efficient operating system for early smartphones, long before the word smartphone meant anything beyond, your phone can install Snake 2. It was engineered for devices with extremely limited memory and low power processors. To achieve this, Symbian used a microkernel architecture and an event-driven design that allowed it to run multiple applications on hardware that would struggle to load a modern lock screen. For years, Symbian dominated the global smartphone market. Nokia, Sony Ericsson, and other major manufacturers built entire product lines around it. Symbian powered business phones, camera phones, multimedia devices, and rugged enterprise handsets. The system supported multitasking, background services, advanced telephony controls, and even early forms of app installation, long before the concept of an app store existed. However, the architecture came with significant complexity. Development required knowledge of Symbian C++, a custom variant of the language with its own memory management conventions. Even simple applications demanded understanding of descriptors, cleanup stacks, and system-specific patterns that made programming unintuitive. Many developers described Symbian as powerful, but only after describing it as exhausting. When the iPhone launched in 2007, the industry shifted toward capacitive touchscreens, rich graphics, and fluid user interfaces. Symbian was designed for keypad navigation and stylus-based systems. Retrofitting it for touch interaction required layers of compatibility code, UI frameworks on top of older frameworks, and hardware variations that produced inconsistent device experiences. Nokia attempted to modernize Symbian multiple times. They introduced Symbian S60 Touch, then Symbian Anna, and finally Symbian Bell each adding more modern interface components. But the core architecture still reflected a world where phones had tiny displays, limited RAM, and button-based navigation. Meanwhile, Android offered a unified development model, consistent hardware assumptions, and a rapidly growing ecosystem that attracted developers immediately. The final turning point came when Nokia announced a partnership with Microsoft to adopt Windows Phone as its primary platform. Symbian was placed into long-term support, and its developer ecosystem collapsed almost overnight. The operating system officially reached end of life in 2014, becoming a historical footnote despite once powering hundreds of millions of devices. Symbian did not fail because it lacked capability. It failed because it was engineered for the constraints of the early 2000s and could not be reshaped quickly enough for the touchscreen era. When the world changed, Symbian stayed optimized for a problem that no longer existed. There's a great video on the screen now. Don't miss it, okay?